Hey everyone, and welcome to the Common Room Podcast on YouTube. Um, we are so excited to be on YouTube and for you to be able to watch the episode. So if you haven't subscribed already, please, please, please subscribe. This really helps our community and helps us give you better stories and better quality content. And um, yeah, without further ado, let's get into the episode. Okay, welcome everyone to the next episode of the Common Room Podcast. This episode, we have a really, really special guest all the way from Serbia who is sitting with us. Um, it's very early in the morning, but we're doing it for the podcast. Uh, her name is Danya, and I'm very, very excited to have her on the podcast and for you to hear her story. So thank you so much, Danya, for being here. I mean, thank you for inviting me. It is such a pleasure to be on your podcast. <laughs> I'm so happy. Okay, so... Let's begin getting into it a bit. Before we start, we usually do a little bit of a rapid fire round with our guests with some fun questions. But before I do that, I wanted to ask, how did you hear about Common Room? Well, that's an interesting story. I was actually the delegate to Nude for Climate uh, Summit in Milan this year. And we have like a WhatsApp group and some delegate from other country. I don't remember which one at this point. Uh, sent a link and she was like look guys this is very interesting podcast you should check it out and I watched the other episode with your Delina and I got very interested and that is how I actually learned about your podcast and then later on I was invited to be a guest and I was really just thrilled um, because I have watched the episode and I really much loved it <laughs> That's amazing. I'm sure Johelina will be really happy to hear that. So shout out to Johelina from the last episode. Uh, if you guys haven't heard the last episode, go listen to it on all our podcast streaming platforms. Um, okay, well, let's begin then with the rapid fire round. All right. <laughs> Great. I hope I'm ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first question of the rapid fire is... What is the last song you sang to yourself or listened to? That's a good question because I don't usually remember that, but <laughs> I do have a playlist of Weekend, so I guess it might have been some of his songs. Okay, amazing. And uh, what is one book you would recommend to uh, the audience listening in? Oh, that, that's also quite a difficult question because it depends if you like, you know, fiction, not fiction. But uh, one book that I will recommend would be Circular Economy. It is actually a book we got in Youth for Climate, which also has, apart from the value in terms of knowledge I've gained from reading the book, it also has a sentimental value to me. It is very much... Um, interesting concept and it explains it deeply but also for examples and I found it very much useful for my further work so that is something I would recommend to listeners. Amazing I actually haven't read that so I'm really curious to read it as well. Um, okay third question um, if you could only eat one food for the rest of your life what would it be? God <laughs> I have a sweet tooth but I would say spaghetti probably with Italian sauce and fancy. <laughs> amazing <Spaghetti>. amazing <laughs> pasta is always really good um and finally would you rather be blind so not have uh your eyesight or would you rather not be able to smell and taste well smell and taste i mean i'm not sure how i'd be able to get around uh, <laughs> without any eyesight uh okay that was a, a really random question that i thought of just right now so Please don't come at me about the question. <laughs> um, but thank you so much. This comes to the end of our rapid fire round. And I hope uh, our listeners have got to learn a little bit more about your quirky side. Um, let's move on now to the actual podcast. Okay, so Danya, you and I have only met once before this. So I actually also don't know a lot about your story. I only caught a glimpse of it. And from what I saw, uh, you've done amazing things at only the age of 18, which is phenomenal. Uh, could you give us a quick rundown of actually what it is um, you do right now um, before we get into your past? So what is it that you're doing right now? And then maybe you can dive into like how you got here. Sure. So when, when somebody asks me, what are you exactly doing? I always get confused because I'm doing quite different things and I'm interested in so many, um, you know, different things that at the first glance aren't very much connected. So. I am finishing out in video design as well as the economic school, which already 
um, doesn't look like it goes together, but it sometimes um, it truly does. I do a lot of um, artistic things. For example, I like to paint in my free time and I also did uh, this performance for concentration camp tour, which is uh, now coming up. Wow. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the application <laughs> is launching actually. So you are able to see it online currently, which is very exciting. Um, and I know this is a podcast about mostly environment, so I'm going to try to focus on that. But if I um, am not quite focused on that, please tell me. <laughs> no worries, just share everything about your story. We're curious about everything. Okay, so uh, basically from the last week on, I am the chair of uh, Children Youth in Agriculture, which is a program of GCYN. Uh, I am a licensed European Union and country coordinator in the same organization. Um, this year I was the delegate of Serbia at Youth for Climate Summit in Milan. I'm also the European Climate Pact Ambassador. I'm a Global Peace Ambassador. So I very much focus on the aspect of peace building and regional cooperation, especially in post-conflict societies, which is uh, one where I'm currently living or Serbia, you know. And apart from that, also the environmental work and the climate change activism and those two aspects I like to bring together through creativity and through my work, which is um, mostly through art, uh, but also through communication. So I think communication, art and these two areas can be interconnected. And I think that is what makes my work uh, quite special to me. Amazing. Oh my God. Every time I hear that, I'm just blown away. Um, can you tell us like, what does it actually mean to be part of the Children, Youth and ag Agriculture? So what does that organization actually do and what is your role in that organization? Mm -hmm. So Children, Youth and Agriculture is actually one of our programs, which I'm leading now. Uh, but we have also Women uh, in Agriculture, which is another program. Uh, we are launching in January of 2022 as planned. Um, we have more than 130 membering countries. So we are launching in uh, all parts of the world. We are on every continent, which is quite exciting. And I feel honored to be the youngest member of the staff and uh, by far the youngest chair, the only chair, I believe, which hasn't received the university diploma yet. Um, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I, I, when I was starting, you know, agriculture wasn't something that I very, was very much interested in. I was mostly doing my activism through my journalism work and for journalism, uh, I started as a TV host and I transitioned into uh, written journalism, uh, mostly online written journalism. And for that, um, you know, I learned that I'm interested in all of these topics. But agriculture wasn't something I planned and then I come from Milano and got quite a few, you know, quite a comprehensive knowledge about that. And then that is when I joined the organization and just learned about their work and got a bit more interested in agriculture and <laughs> here I am. Amazing. This has been a journey. That sounds absolutely fantastic. And you mentioned that you started this journey by being a TV host and then you got into written journalism. Um, so wh at what age did you become a TV host? Uh, and how did that come about? Like, did you decide, wake up one day and be like, okay, I want to be on TV. <laughs> I mean, I believe I was 12 or 13 when I started. So I, I was five years doing, um, I mean, working on TV and it was every day because the show aired each day. So once a, once a week we were filming and it has been, you know, I, I am very grateful that I got quite a different life experience to many of my peers, especially in my country. You know, I grew up basically on TV and so I'm very much comfortable with camera. And <laughs> even now when I'm speaking and uh, when I'm giving interviews or interviewing people, they're like, oh, you don't even, you know, <laughs> see that camera is there. But it, it is truly like that. But it has been uh, so... I started at the age of 12, so then around the age of 16, 17, I transitioned into written journalism, but uh, at some point there was both written journalism and TV journalism, but how I got the idea was that my mom is actually a journalist, and when I was really young, she used to work on TV. Uh, she was reporting from the conflicts from Serbia and Kosovo, 
um, she was a TV reporter, so I used to watch her, and um, yes, I, I it was very much dear to my heart. And I was looking at her, and I was like, I want to be a TV host someday, and it just <laughs> it Amazing. just happened. That's honestly so great. Um, and uh, yeah, I really think uh, being in television, especially at a very young age, can really help you like with public speaking, but also just confidence right and speaking in uh with people you don't really stutter so much you're very like quick to like give responses uh and i can totally see that uh during this interview <laughs> um actually it's not really an interview it's more me being extremely curious about uh your life and everything you've done um but okay well uh you also mentioned that you were a global peace ambassador and i have always been fascinated by this term because i see it uh, with people and I'm always like, okay, what does it mean to be a global peace ambassador? Uh, so can you talk a little bit about that? Like, what does it mm -hmm. actually mean? It basically means that we do a lot of promotion of the values of peace and the organization Peace Chain, um, and also bring attention uh, to the conflicts and also the possibilities for peace building in the world. I was also the delegate at the Ubuntu Leaders Academy, which helped me a lot. It was the concept of Ubuntu. I don't know if you heard of that. That is the yes. ancient African <laughs> philosophy. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> yes. Um. And, I, and that also very much helped me in my work. And then I did also the, the uh, I had a TV podcast and the, um, and I have, uh, yes, the project, uh, which was called Two Sides of a Coin, which we explored the a common ground between Serbia, Albania and Kosovo with young leaders and young experts from two or three countries depends how you you know acknowledge that uh, but it was very much an amazing experience and now because i'm very much interested both in peace building but also now in my environmental work i would like to connect those two and start my non-government organization which i want to focus on that i want to focus and uh, you know regional cooperation with uh, climate change activism and i want to send a message especially in the balkans that you know the climate change doesn't know no borders so wow so your uh, ngo or non-governmental organization would be about climate change and sharing the message that climate change has no borders yes <laughs> amazing amazing that sounds that's fantastic and um are you currently working on this ngo or like building this ngo um yes with another youth for climate delegate from my country we went to, uh, on together we didn't know each other but during milan we met each other and it was quite an interesting story because getting back from the milan to serbia wasn't the easiest thing we done so we almost missed the flight i mean oh my god i got on the flight but she uh ended up having to catch up another flight and our pcr test <laughs> Time <laughs> has been running out, so we got very much through that trouble. We got very much connected, and uh, after that, after the Milano, we sat together down on a um, coffee and a piece of cake, and we were discussing. We have to do something. We had this amazing opportunity, which only two people from country get to, and we met Vanessa Nakata. We met Greta. We were wow. on climate strike in Milan, and. We met so many young and inspiring activists and we heard stories from 186 countries and we have to do something with this. We, you know, not every voice, which is great and yeah, especially young voice get heard. And if you have the opportunity to sh spread the knowledge, spread the experience, we want to do something with it. And then came the idea to start a non-government organization. So yes, that is a plan definitely for 2022, the beginning of 2022, but we will see. Amazing. Amazing. Okay, so uh, I actually want to steer the conversation a little bit in a different direction because we're talking about all these like amazing big things that you are a part of and that you do. Uh, and it's phenomenal. I want to know a little bit more about your personal story and personal side and relationship with the environment. Um, because in India, for me, when I was really young, I um, my first contact with the environment was at, at a very early age, especially learning that, okay, we are harming the environment and we need to do something about it. Uh, I wanted to ask you, like uh, growing up in Serbia, how um, when was your first sort of instance where you realized, like, okay, um, yeah, we need to do something about the, we need to change the way we live or, yeah, we need to treat our environment differently. Like, how did you fall into this journey? 
Oh, yes. So, um, during my growing up experience in Serbia, uh, actually my grandma is living in a small village and it is so beautiful with, you know, just untouched nature. It is quite a remote one. So I grew up on the relation between Belgrade, which is a huge city, which is a capital, is 2 million people. And this small village, so I had the opportunity to see the both worlds and how, you know, Belgrade isn't the cleanest city, I must say, even though I love my, my you know, childhood city. Um, we have a lot of, um, especially back then, we had a lot of um, problems with just plastic all around. And it was a nice city to live in, but when you are young, you realize that you know, this place, which is more remote, you see how the nature is untouched and we see how we harmed it here. But also, you know, Belgrade, uh, especially in uh, recent years, has become one of the most polluted cities when it comes to air. It is interesting that we are on the top of the list. Sometimes we rank first, <laughs> sometimes wow. we don't rank first. <laughs> But, uh, and it stirred up, you know, curiosity with me because Serbia doesn't have, it isn't the most rich country in the world. It doesn't have a good economy and it also doesn't have any almost um, heavy industry. So I'm, you know, still for a scientist, it is quite um, an enigma why we have so much pollution because we don't have a good industry and uh, you know, it is, we use, you know, older cars, that is, and uh, many of the people use uh, still wood uh, for the heating. But apart from that, uh, our air quality is quite bad. And when you, you know, walk around the city and you see people wearing masks, you're not because of the corona, <laughs> but because of the air pollution, it starts wow. up in your mind, hey, we have to do something about it. Amazing. Wow. I mean, I can imagine that that's very like strong imagery for you to, yeah, get involved and actually start taking action. And uh, I wanted to ask you, like, what are some things that you do in your personal life that uh, actually maybe let's start with, do you identify yourself as an environmentalist? I would say that is a part of my, my you know, personality. But as I'm doing so many things, I cannot label myself. You know, mm. if I would label myself one thing, then that means that I am not able to do another thing. So I would like to say that I am fluid in all of my interests, but I don't like labels. <laughs> yeah, much. nice. Yeah, we talked about this uh, with the previous uh, episode as well, in a previous episode as well, uh, with the whole idea of labels and how uh, some people like to use labels, but uh, because it gives them comfort um, and some people don't like to use labels and that's kind of what we're trying to do here with Common Room which is to understand what is really the issue with the environmentalist label right now and how we can sort of change that and get more people to operationalize on it and use it for be for good you know um, and so I was thinking like uh, because you do uh, all these environmentally related things what are some things you do in your personal life um, that uh, make you feel like you can fall under being an environmentalist. Well, I would say there are people who are quite extreme when it comes to this, but I believe if we make one small change each day, then that counts. It is not important that one person do all of the things and she isn't eating meat or he isn't eating meat and he um, tries to be as much, you know, to use uh, less uh, of so-called not... Uh, uh, not clear energy, then he or she does everything, but the other person does nothing. It is important that we work together cohesively as a society to transition into, it is called actually a green transition, but I would not say that it is only connected to using solar waste of, um, you know, energy, but also trying to do small things in our daily life. For example, can I walk to get a day to the school uh, or should I take a bus? That is one decision which doesn't make a lot of impact. And when you look at that, you would think, okay, am I tired? Do I want to walk? But uh, the thing is, the small decisions you make up during the year, we have 365 chances to make our environment better. Uh, it all piles up and the end of the year, you can truly be proud of yourself because you can start with using less plastic. You can start with, you know, recycling, which isn't common here, I must say. We don't recycle a lot in Serbia. Because it turns out to be more expensive for us to recycle than to, to you know, 
um, buy new things but the thing is we have to maybe try with reusing things which that is the concept of the circular economy which i mentioned uh, making a new purpose for things because recycling especially for different materials can be quite expensive and as i come from quite an interesting background because my family business is uh, or used to be connected to uh, production and distribution of um, the um, gas and the nafta <laughs> Yeah, so it's quite a different, uh, we don't do quite that, we transitioned, we don't do that, but now, uh, you know, my grandfather and, you know, people before him used to um, have the company, which uh, concentrated on that, now we do uh, mostly construction work, which is both, uh, we use <laughs> materials which are environmentally friendly, and we also uh, do um, the I don't know how to translate it in English, but we um, actually built the houses which are self uh, resi resilient. Resilient, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so we you have your own water which is collected, and you have your we use solar energy in all of our buildings. So it is quite a transition. Um, but yes, coming from that background, I mean. I, I've truly seen uh, the impact that my, you know, uh, in the past, my ancestors have made and I want to have, I have also the personal obligation to do something. Amazing, amazing. And so you mentioned that you uh, almost treated like you have 365 chances uh, and you just take every chance uh, and at the end of the year you see, okay, what you've done. Uh, and it's really like every day is a new day and you get to start over again and decide what choices you make. I love that. I love that philosophy of thinking about it because I think that's very similar to my philosophy in the sense that I'm not, uh, I'm a very like imperfect environmentalist. Uh, I'm in no means able to do everything all the time. Uh, so it's nice to think that, okay, I have 365 chances to do something uh, every time. Uh, I love that. Okay, great. Um, and to sort of round off this conversation, uh, I wanted to ask you what would be some advice or uh, yeah, just something you'd like to tell uh, people who are listening in, especially uh, young people from all over the world who are now sort of awakening into their environment, young or old actually, who are awakening into their environmental journeys. Well, it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter your hair color, your skin color. It doesn't matter, uh, you know, uh, your background. If you have, you know, many people don't start with their environmental work or, you know, any type of work because they don't think they're competent enough. But the thing is, if you don't have self, you know, um, self-confidence you will never be competent enough there is always be something okay i need this degree then i need this to start and we are always looking for perfect circumstances but they will not come so you have to start today and it doesn't matter on which level you start because many people often would like to start at the biggest level okay <laughs> i got so many questions how they can apply for the conference and i always say okay the application process for 2021 since the um, some the conference used for climate is already over but for the next year you can apply here and here on the website but the thing is they haven't done um, any environmental work prior to that and mm. I don't see there <laughs> want to but they would like to go on the highest level you have to start somewhere and it doesn't matter how many people you impact even if you impact one person that is already a great success and you know higher things and the things you perceive as more important will come with time but you have to start somewhere and not chase too high. You have to be self-confident and also don't label yourself. If you would like to be an artist and environmentalist, even though that's not usually how we think of the people who are interested in environmental work, you can. And if you're interested in cars and you know other <laughs> things, then you can still be an environmentalist. We need people from different backgrounds. And I think that was truly reflected in Youth for Climate because that document is the work of people from so many different backgrounds with uh, you know university studies with masters with you know not even any school and uh, it was amazing. amazing that we have so many different levels i love that i really love that advice and i think i would have also benefited from it 
um, when I was 18, um, because you get carried away by the glitz and the glamour of things in the sense that also it, with being an environmentalist, uh, you want to be, you want to do big things, like be part of the UN or, uh, you know, be a global peace ambassador. Um, but it really starts from the small things that you do and the com like the community impact that you make, right? And the impact that you also make on yourself. So uh, I think that's actually really, really uh, important and valuable advice uh, that you gave and uh, very wise for someone um at your age <laughs> um and uh, yeah so thank you so much for sharing that and uh yeah i would uh like to ask if there's any final thoughts or words that you have um before uh you say goodbye to the audience no i'm very much happy to have been on your podcast and I'm looking forward to the other episodes because now I am caught on the wagon of uh, binge watching them. <laughs> so I have to have some more new content to watch. Amazing. But apart from that, thank you for having me. And th I would like to thank all of the listeners. And yes, and keep doing your great work in environmental, <laughs> but any other area you're interested in. Thank you so much. Okay, well... Uh, Thank you everyone for watching this episode or listening into this podcast with Dania. Uh, it was really amazing and inspiring to have this conversation with her. We did it at around 8.30 in the morning. So I now feel refreshed to take on the day with a new hope and inspiration. Um, if you really enjoyed listening to this video, please give it a thumbs up. Um, or watching this video, I would say. Um, and if you are listening in, well, just show us your support by uh, following us on our podcast platforms. Um, if you would like to know a little bit more about Danya, you can always head on to our Instagram um, at Common Room Org or uh, at our website, uh, which is still under construction, but we'll be releasing soon. So uh, please have a look out for that because a lot of resources will be available, especially a lot more in-depth into this episode and some resources that we'll ask Danya to share with you, uh, especially for those interested in the things that she's a part of, like being a global peace ambassador, um, etc. So uh, please follow us on Instagram and stay tuned. And thank you so much for being